Welcome. Um, my name is Pat McGuire. I'm the interim provost here. To, in, in, oh my God! I'm going to make a mistake like that. I'm the interim president. I was the interim provost, amongst that many other things. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm delighted to be here tonight for the Martin Luther King lecture. Uh, Reverend King had a major impact on my life. Um, as a son, uh, a son of Irish immigrants, born in New York City. My parents were from Ireland and from Scotland. I was raised in Rowing, New Jersey, and my world was a segregated world. I played hoops with African-American kids, loved it, and I went to public high school. Uh, excuse me, uh, they went to public high school, and I went to a Catholic school in the next town. But I played basketball with them again. Um, and enjoyed it. I lived a very sheltered life. And the first voices, uh, I began to hear voices that uh, challenged that life from Dr. King. And I didn't have any answers. I didn't have any answers to these challenges through college. I, li I listened to his message of love and compassion for all men and women who were all created equal. And he became someone that young Pat McGuire looked at as an example of a life of service and compassion for all men and women. And tonight I look forward to hearing our guest speaker, Dr. Wilkinson, about a man who influenced and impacted the lives of all people all over the world. Dr. Wilkinson will be up in a moment, and now we'll have a, a formal introduction. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Linda Bassman Jr., and I'm a member of the Upsilon Pi Chapter of Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Seated here at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is the fraternity of Brother Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So it is with much honor and gratitude that I am pleased to introduce our Hobart and William Smith College's 2019 Martin Luther King Jr. keynote address speaker, the Reverend Dr. William Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson grew up in Boston, in Boston, Massachusetts. He prepared himself academically by obtaining a bachelor's degree in speech therapy, a master's in sociology, and a master's in counseling and guidance from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. <clears throat> he taught at Holyoke Community College and served as a director for black studies at Dartmouth College. He then pondered going to med medical school, so he moved to New York City and gained employment in a pharmacy department while also serving as a union delegate. His union, 1199 Service Employees International and the Hospital League, sent him to the medical school on a full scholarship. It's amazing. He trained as a medical doctor at Albert Einstein School of Medicine in the Bronx and taught medicine at the City of New York College of Medicine and Downstate Medical Center. He has a long resume. <laughs> he also studied public health in Kenya and got a master's degree in epidemiology in London. Dr. Wilkinson then decided to go into private practice and moved to Jamestown, New York, where he met his wife, Sherry, a healthcare worker herself. He has been involved in the church from his youth and was a Sunday school teacher. So in 2002, he decided to go to seminary. Colgate Rochester Crows and Divinity School would become his place of enlightenment from 2003 to 2006. After his graduation from Colgate Rochester Crows and Divinity School, Wilkinson has served Elmhood, Elmhood Presbyterian Church in Syracuse, Dansville Presbyterian Church, Trinity Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Rochester, and is now serving First Presbyterian Church in Medina, New York. In addition to being a husband, he is also a father. Join me as we welcome a distinguished gentleman the Reverend Dr. William Wilkinson. Good evening. It's good to be here. With you. On this one fall evening, middle-aged man was walking along a pretty dusty road. And as he got to a crossroads, he, he saw a, a woman about his age 
sitting on a large stone at the crossroads. She seemed quite relaxed, and she had next to her a large sack. And he thought quickly, perhaps she has some nourishment in there, perhaps even some water or even wine. I, I'm going to ask her. He said, dear woman, do you have a bite to eat or something to drink for a stranger on the road? She says, of course I do, please, please sit down. And she reached into her satchel and she took out a loaf of bread. She broke half, gave him half, and she started to eat as he was eagerly eating. And then she reached in and pulled out two cups. And yes, there was wine. And she poured some in it. And as he saw her reach, something, something of the sun flashed back to him from inside the satchel. He thought this might be a precious jewel. As she reached to put the bottle back in, he said, yes, it is a sapphire. Why, if she gave me that sapphire, I could be content for the rest of my life. She was so inviting and so welcoming, he said, dear woman, would you share that jewel with me? She said, of course. And she reached in, grabbed the sapphire, you know, sapphire's quite empty, and gave it to him and wished him well on his journey. Well, he quickly went around the road, you know, like in those ads when you get a good deal on Verizon and you, 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 take your, and you, you take your receipt and you go out the door, you know. And, but as he was out of her sight and looking at the jewel and thinking about his life to come, he turned around. He went back to where she was. He said, wise woman, please take back your jewel and share with me that which enabled you to give it to me. I want to share with you tonight my most recent reflections on Martin Luther King's call to us, call to leadership. As if we were that man on the road and were open to hearing a new story. My understanding is that Martin, they grow all the time. Martin King came into my life in a real way on the day after he was assassinated, I was in graduate school and, of course, we marched. And from that day forward, I have been working on what does it mean to celebrate the life of Martin Luther King. My beginning place for the last few years has been with his father. Michael King, who you know as Martin King Sr. Michael King was a Baptist minister and very much involved with the Baptist World Alliance. So much so that in 1934, he traveled with the Alliance to the International Meeting, which was held in Germany that year, 1934. So you know that before Jesse Owens won all that stuff in the Olympics, Daddy King saw the Nazism rising in that culture. He and the members of the Baptist World Alliance passed a resolution and they had a demonstration in Germany against anti-Semitism. When he came back, he shared with Alberta, his wife, that he had been to Wittenberg. He had seen the place where Martin Luther had nailed 95 discussions on the door of the church that he loved. And then Alberta did her miraculous teaching. Now you know, Michael King changed his name and changed his son, Michael Jr.'s name, to Martin Luther King Jr. 
I said to myself this morning, now I haven't, I haven't found out what his, his wife's name was, and I found out it's Alberta and I said, because she has to be one of the most important people in Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. Imagine that a mother allows her husband to change, not his name, yo, you want to change your name? Go ahead, you're always doing something crazy. But change my son's name? Wow, that must have been a powerful experience that he had. A powerfully strong relationship and mutual understanding that they had. And whatever he said, I don't know how he did it. But she authorized a name change for her son. <coughs> One of the things I want to share with you is, as we celebrate Martin Luther King, we celebrate those who led to him being the person we knew him to be. We were sitting at the table today talking about the how to the Saudi people. The people, and we're talking about the keep, keepers of the western door. My wife and I lived in Webster, New York for two years on the lake. We went to uh, Ganondigan and looked at some of the maps on the wall and saw the pathways of the Seneca people that went by our house, between our house and the water. It reminded me that all of us are trotting paths which have been trod many times before. Walt Whitman captured this in a in words that are quoted by Beaumont Newhall in his Words of the Earth, the pictures are by Ansel Adams. And there's a picture of, of the timberline, just above the timberline, where everything is small stones. The snow is just beyond. And he's quoted as saying, we have been trodding paths which have been trod many times before. So it was with Martin Luther King. As we celebrate his legacy, his call to us, we also acknowledge the long tradition out of which he comes. Martin King was on that long walk to freedom that we talked about, that long journey. I've been impressed as I learned that his journey that he shared with us began before he graduated from high school. When he was 15 years old, he gave a speech at school. The Negro and the Constitution, talking about the injustices and the contrasts between being Negro and being another American. But that's the last time he only talked about race relations in the United States. As he went to Morehouse College and then to Crozer Seminary, one of the schools that contributed to Colgate Rochester Crozer as we know it today, he began to write letters to people in South Africa. He began to give talks about the connection between racism and colonialism. In 1957, his correspondence with Reverend Albert Luthuli from South Africa became so strong that over the next four years, they fashioned a correspondence and a commitment that led to both of them getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Luthuli, I think, in 61 and King in 64. In 57, he worked with Eleanor Roosevelt, the former First Lady, and Reverend James Pike from the Episcopal Church. They wrote a document which was a call to conscience, a call to conscience about South Africa and apartheid. All during those early years then, it became evident that for King, the idea that we hear about in the news, think global, act local, was all that King was doing. 
You see, his commitments were to justice around the world. His local happened to be, well, I'm African American, I'm a minister of an African American church, what are my people experiencing? That's where my local version will be. But always, all during the movement, he was involved in international things. When Ghana became independent, Kwame Nkrumah invited him to uh, Ghana and he went. See, all during the civil rights movement, because they're connected. There is no division of these struggles. King then was a person who did not view black and white as the limits of his concern. Black and white happened to be where he lived, but he was supportive of all struggles, of all peoples everywhere. Now, when I say that King was so influenced by his dad. That doesn't mean that his dad was the definer of everything that he stood for. His dad was a, well, an international sort of religious, I wouldn't call him a bigot, but he didn't like President Kennedy because he was Catholic. Didn't like Robert Kennedy because he was Catholic. But then Robert Kennedy wrote King a letter, his son a letter, and said, you're doing great work. And the east up a little bit. <laughs> the lesson, of course, for us is that even as you live out portions of the old story, you're always going to be called to ask yourself, what is the new story? What is the new story? There's always going to be that, that break from the past of what is to what will be. That was his life. Some of the most powerful writing that King has done is in his speeches. And not just I have a dream, because he not only had a dream, he had a vision. And not only had a vision, he had a plan. Herman Hilbo is one of the, in the 1950s, one of the uh, directors of public health in New York State. He said that any Health plan that's not written down is not really a plan. And so one of the things that uh, is behind King's journey is his vision. He had a vision which began with understanding that the world is a house. His speech was, this is about the world house. That the idea of diversity is not just us feeling good about one another, whoever you are, different from me, but that our reality is we are a world house. On our cards on the table, you saw words about the beloved community. Now, we take this great idea for granted and sometimes we trip over it because we, we urge it to tell it to build the beloved community. And that's not what came was talking about. King would say, we are the beloved community. It's not beloved because you and me love each other, or are working on loving each other. It's beloved because God loves us. And for those of you who believe in Gaia, Gaia loves us. And those of you who believe only in humanity, humanity loves us. That thing which is greater than us is why we are connected. So we can build up the beloved community, we can equip the beloved community, but the fact is we are the beloved community, just don't recognize it all the time. King called us then to live as if we were part of the world house, or because, better said, we are the world house. So therefore, it wasn't a surprise that he moved beyond respecting one religion to another to saying the beginning is respect, but we must live then into what we say we believe. We must be the beloved community. King made some very important journeys during the 50s. One was course, to Ghana, but another was to India. 
Now, we know that Gandhi was dead already, so why did he go to India? Anybody here ever gone to a place where dead folks built it, but somehow you knew that if you went there, it would just do something in you, it would change you, it would touch you? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And so what, what did he go there for? How did it touch him? You remember that, that Martin King would always talk about the three evils. You've heard of that? Three evils? Poverty, racism, militarism. And by the way, for those of you who think that that means he was against the military, that's not what militarism is. Militarism is worshiping violence and thinking that violence is the answer to every human solution when you finally can't agree quickly. Militarism, it's the difference between having uh, a National Guard and having militia in your backyard that have funny looking attitudes and, and shotguns that have your name on it. He was a person who believed that before you, people have done some things on which you have to build. And one of the things, of course, that he learned from Gandhi, the idea of nonviolence, yeah, but he learned to begin to capture what does it mean, this idea of justice, or as King would say, public love. And so he let himself be inspired by Gandhi's concepts, one of the most important of which was Gandhi's seven deadly social sins. Read more about it, but I'll just say that wealth without work, religion without sacrifice, knowledge without morality. Arun Gandhi, uh, uh, Mohandas Gandhi's uh, grandson, said not only were there seven sins of my grandfather's uh, description, and by the way, my grandfather learned it from, of all places, we're in Hobart, we're an Episcopal priest, who, who earlier that year, in 1925, had given a sermon on the seven deadly social evils. So King comes with three evils. What he was saying is, Gandhi has taught me, as he learned, that every society has some social evils, sins. Arun Gandhi calls them blunders. Anybody understand why he calls them blunders? When I first heard it, I said, blunders? But I like that idea of sins, but then I'm a pastor, so of course, you know, that. No, he was saying blunders because there's the seven wonders, and then there's the seven blunders. <laughs> and we should be just as amazed that we've fallen into those blunder traps as we are amazed by wonders. Arun Gandhi, of course, would add always that rights without responsibility are really what it all adds up to. Really what it all adds up to. And then he had this vision of the ecumenical interfaith spirit. Not just the recognition and of the value of the other, but learning from the other, acting with the other for the benefit of the world house. One of King's last books was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Where do we go from here? Can you say that with me? Where do we go from here? Now hidden in that phrase is everything of importance that I want to share with you tonight. Where? If you say the word where, that means you know you, you're not there yet. you got to get there. And it's 360 degrees, so in order to say where, you have to be working on some idea of direction. Now, you know how paths are. You can go there by going east and then north, west. And... It doesn't have to be so narrow, but it's got to be someplace different from where you are. So if you dare to ask the question, where, as you celebrate Dr. King, you're beginning to walk that journey. Do, do. If you dare to say those words, do, that means that you know you have to act. You cannot 
be in the same space, doing the same thing. You must be engaged. We, now that's the most powerful word, that's right in the middle, we. If you say we, that means it's everybody. No exceptions. Everybody. Sister Preaching, one of my heroes, whose prison ministry brought her to be the person who had to work with a convicted murderer who was about to be executed a month or two from the time she met him. And faithfully she, she counseled him every day and always in her prayers and in her conversation would ask him, do you take responsibility for what has happened? And up until the day he was executed, he said, no, I didn't do anything wrong. As the word got out that she was visiting this convicted murderer who had murdered a family, she became vilified. Why is she going to see him? He's rotten. What's wrong with her? She doesn't know what she's doing. <clears throat> she came to see him every day, and the day he was executed, as she was in prayer with him, he said, Sister, I did kill those people. Will God forgive me? Will you pray for me? There is a cost to recognizing the other as you, as a part of you. The South Africans offer the word Ubuntu. Ubuntu meaning I am because we Go, well, that may be self-evident. Go. You have got to move and be moving. Let yourself be moved. And if you talk about moving, you don't do it alone. Even Jesus in our faith did not do it alone. We understand from the Gospel of Matthew, after the resurrection that Jesus was on the mountain, the appointed place with 11 of his disciples who were still alive. And the translations in the Greek, in most of our Bibles say, and some doubted. But if you go back to the Greek, there is no word for some that's on that page in Greek. It says they doubted. So Jesus said to all these doubters, the ones who ran from him, hid from the Romans, testified they never heard of him before, ran and hid. Only the women were out there, you know, going to visit Jesus and looking for him. And Jesus said, guess what? I want you guys who were, who were backsliders to go out and teach everybody everything I taught you, which was love God and love your neighbor, by the way. And your enemy is your neighbor, too. And then... In his wisdom, Jesus said, and I'm going to be with you always. And, the, and in the Hebrew and uh, the rabbi's tradition, they would say, between those lines, read the Midrash. I know this is going to be hard. Now, I know you all don't get it yet. You're beginning, but you don't get it yet. But guess what? My love is with you always. Did you ever hear King say, it doesn't matter to me now. He wasn't saying that, that he's sad, right? Longevity has its place. I want to live a long life. But what he's really saying is, it's gonna, God's love is going to have to be enough now. From. That's the hard one. From. Because from implies that whatever we're doing, whatever place we're standing in, it's not the place where you need to be. We had a conversation at the dinner table about vocation and advocation. And uh, I want to add to some of the stuff that I talked to Lyndon about. And uh, my other brother was there. <coughs> you see, sometimes we get language wrong. It becomes convenient to shape our lives according to the way we want to shape 
the language. And so it used to be that if you were called to the ministry, it was a vocation. So you called by God. And then, well, but maybe if you're in medicine, you're called by God too. Or maybe law. You see how we start to change it? And then maybe plumbing. When I was a sheet metal worker, I loved being a sheet metal worker. You know what I'm saying? After 9 11, we were building those new walls for the Pentagon right here in Western New York. But it was because I decided to do it. My family needed me to have a job. But it wasn't a calling. My calling still was being positive with folks, raising issues, not being afraid, guiding folks when I could, learning to shut up when it wasn't me who was supposed to be telling people what to do. We have kids in college, and we say that they're studying for their vocation. Well, really they're not. They're studying for their advocation. Because if King is right, if it's a world house, and if we're supposed to have that spirit of unity, then that is all of our calling. Everyone has the same vocation, and the avocation, what we call vocation so easily, careers, that's just the material base from which we can do this vocation to which we've all been called. Now, why is that important? Well, sometimes we can live our whole life, even retire, satisfied that we've done our part. When all we've done is the avocation, the material stuff, and maybe still haven't engaged the real vocation. The person is on the deathbed. Father, I wish I'd love people more, and I want to give my money to this, and I want to. Okay, but you could have been doing that. If you understood that avocation and vocation, they go together. But don't confuse them. Your vocation is what you're called to do because you're a member of the world house. For me, I have been, as every pastor tries to do, trying to wrestle with, what's my vision? What is the oomph behind what I'm going to be doing in my family, in my congregation, in my community? What I'm working now is something that Dr. King inspired me to. I call it the four C's. Seven deadly, three evils. Here are the four C's that I want to leave with you. And I want to leave time for a lot of questions and answers. I believe that our first principle is to grapple with cosmos. It's a reality that we human beings share planet Earth. Now, if we were talking about uh, the house that we live in, there would be no question. We all share the house. We've got to keep the bathroom clean. We've got to keep the beds made. Or if they mess up, then somebody's got to fix it up. We've got to have a meal, clean up after the meal, dishes, all that stuff. Take out the garbage. Now, you don't just throw the garbage any old place. You have a place for it. And it's everybody's responsibility, depending upon the age and the family. This one has this responsibility, this one has shown responsibility, all that kind of stuff. But what if then the world house is just a bigger version of that? Well, the earth is our world house. Tom Chapin has a little song. This pretty planet spinning in space. You're a garden, you're a harbor, you're a holy place. Golden sun going down, pretty blue giant, span us around, all through the night, yes, straight through the morning light. We share this earth. So we cannot honor the world house unless we are taking care of the earth, pure and simple. Now it's hard. Changing your life so that you're not only recycling, but thinking about how we're going to heat and cool and how we're going to share. And wow. Now we are stewards of 25% of the world's water in our area. 25% of the fresh water in the whole earth is here, right around us. We have greater responsibility for shepherding that 25%. 
than people on the other side of the globe. But they have their charges as well. The second thing we've got to do is we've got to pay attention to commonwealth. You know, I come from Massachusetts and we used to take pride. We're one of the couple of commonwealths there. We're the commonwealth of Massachusetts and there's a commonwealth of Virginia. We forget that, well, the people who started Massachusetts didn't include the Native Americans. And the Puritans didn't want to include anybody, but they found that they only married Puritans that they couldn't have very many babies, so they made half Puritans. Read the book. Half Puritans, and then finally, oh, we just get Presbyterian, Unitarians, and Baptists. <laughs> it is such a challenge. The heart of Commonwealth is to understand poverty. Poverty is not a description of what you have in your pocket or don't have, or what somebody else has or doesn't have. Poverty is a description of the results of manufactured economic disparity. <coughs> we do it, the Chinese do it, the Russians do it, the Ghanaians do it. The only ones that I know that are really sort of doing a pretty good job with this are the, are the Danish. I mean, really, taxes 70%, but everybody got health care, everybody got a real living wage. You can leave the baby in the pram outside, you know, the, the baby carriage outside the store and everybody watches out for it. I mean, today it happens. No child abuse charges, it's just that people take care of one. But if they can do it, why can't we? Oh, they're richer than us. I don't think so. I don't think so. Commonwealth. We've got to figure out a way to share these resources. Now, according to Dr. King, it's not just that he wants you to be nice about it. What he's saying is, God gave us enough in this life, enough in this country, that if we shared it, there'd be enough. Think about it. Look at all the land we have and all those resources. And yet we're crowding everybody in the cities. Why don't we have another land grant program? Instead of getting a covered wagon and having to displace somebody and fight to get to the land, there's enough land, we can give out land. We can give out land. We can even reform land. When Julius Nyeri and his government first started their freedom time in Tanzania, they passed a rule that if you were a member of Tanu, the political party, you could only own two houses, no more. You could own your house and a house for your family, or if you wanted to rent it, fine. Why? That was an effort to try to build in anti-corruption, because everybody knew that one of the biggest things that happens in, in, in a corrupt government is the rich grabbing the land. And when the Europeans leave, be the Europeans with dark skin that take their place. The challenge of the commonwealth is there before us. And it's before all of us, because all of us have enough. We wouldn't be able to come to this meeting if we didn't have enough. The question is, how are we sharing our enough? And how are our neighbors sharing their enough so that all have enough? The next one is, of course, one of my life events. Common promise. Common promise means the challenge of peace and peacemaking. One of my parishioners uh, said to me last night, are you, uh, are you watching The Black Earth Rising on Netflix? It's like, I haven't heard of it. Oh, it's about the Hutus and, and, and the Tutsis, and, but it's about what France did in the background. I went home and last night I went through half of the series. I'm gonna finish it tonight before I go to sleep. <laughs> And what that's about, of course, is that peacemaking takes time and there are steps. International peacemakers teach us that first, if you're going to make peace, after you start with respect, and you must, you got to tell the truth. you got to tell the truth. And telling the truth doesn't have to be just after your face. You did this! It can say, this is 
It was done by people who have the same color as you. It was supported by people who have the same color as me. And the trick about peacemaking, a truth telling, is that the next step is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now Martin King didn't invent that, but he was talking about that. Forgiveness means, well, since I'm telling the truth, and since we respect one another, I call to forgive you. In the, the Christian Bible, it says, do not judge. If I don't forgive you, then I stand in judgment. How could, how could the clerk and Mandela both get a joint Nobel Prize when they started so far apart and stood for such a different perspective? of life. Well, they worked on it. Imagine that the people in your area, you know, we talked earlier about how we're trying to try, but then there's this struggle over here and there's not as many people. Imagine them. One is in prison and the other one's the head of the government and they found their way over a number of years to have a conversation that ended up in the change of a regime like a part that And with one leaving the presidency and the other stepping in, greatly respected. Greatly respected. It is then, after you have told the truth and truly forgiven, that you can join one another in seeking justice. Seeking justice. And now that was what Dr. King was doing. Earlier I told you, um, if we dare celebrate Dr. King. You know, Jeremiah, the great prophet, um, the great teacher of mine from the Bible, he has a, a speech, and I, I remember the last time I quoted this in church, I had my long black robe that I wear every Sunday, and I was just about to do a long prayer, and I said, you know, Jeremiah says, all of you all who are in long black robes and given a lot of prayers. That's not what God wants you to do. In other words, you have to live as your celebration. Not just words. Not just a couple of songs. Unless the song is what you do to keep you able to stay in the game. We shall not, we shall not be moved. to well, some by people who are out there risking their lives. Now we sing it in church sometimes, but the reason why we sing it in church is when, it's like the, the Boy Scouts, right? The Boy Scouts, I was a scout too. With Flint and Steel. We shall not, we shall not, when we sing it in church, is hitting the flame. It's gonna catch fire, right? It's gonna catch fire, it's gonna catch fire. And every once in a while, somebody says, oh yes, we're going to Uganda, we're doing a trip to Uganda. Or we're going over to the flood zone in New Jersey. Or we're going down the street to the food pantry. <coughs> or we invited an uh, immigrant family to come live with us because their house on the farm burned down. If, if our faith is put into action, that would be the celebration of Martin Luther King Day. And finally, Common ground. Common ground. People of traditional religions and new religions and of what they say is no religion, but we know that, the, that humanism, in fact, is a religion. There's a humanist church, a mother church is in New York City. I lived down the street from them for several years. Every human being has spiritual values. Don't have to call it spiritual, but it is. Take any old graduate student in anthropology and have them come to your house and they can write a paper on what you're doing that's spiritual. But more than that, even in traditional terms, every single written religion, every religion that has texts, has these words or a variation, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Matthew 7, 12. But it's in every faith that you can name that has something written down. 
You think that's by accident? That's part of the world house. Something has inspired every single society that has had enough so that they could actually write, spend the time writing rather than hunting or gathering, has that principle, that common ground. So it doesn't just have to be that we have an interfaith coalition. It can be that we have a coalition that recognizes the common ground. And here's the good part. Herman Hilbo, would, I know he's passed, but I know his spirit is out there. He would love this. The vision that I'm talking about, it's already in writing. The Universal Racist Conference of 1915 happened in Paris. They were talking about what you were talking about, white supremacy and the need to grab. 1915! The year of the founding of the National Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Carl G. Woodson. We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And go read it and you read it recently. Read it again. Because according to that, it's not a question of having a right to work state. It's, that's, a, that's illegal according to international law that we are signatories of. A living wage is guaranteed there. The right to health care is guaranteed there. So we have the written vision. All we need to do is live into it. We have to live into it. More than that, the Charter for Compassion was written in 2009. How many know of the existence of the Charter for Compassion? Karen Armstrong, a historian of religion, uh, who wrote the history of God, was given a TED grant. It's like $250,000 to $300,000. Take two years and do whatever you want with this. Do some good stuff. And what she did was gather religious people from all kinds of faiths across the world. And they wrote over that two or three years period the Charter for Compassion. Go online. It's right there. Because by now, it's not only the Charter, which is basically the golden rule in law and hand, but they have online courses in compassion of all different kinds that cost like $5. 20 weeks online, $20, 15 weeks online, accessible to anybody, the Charter for Compassion, based on the Golden Rule. They have a page, a page on their website, the history of the Golden Rule. The Golden Rule in seven religions. You could teach this, and it's, it's all there. So we have in writing this vision. It's a plan. And the challenge is, to see this common ground as a way of making the connection. One of the, our young students said something about hope that was really great to hear because hope, I believe, is even more important than love. Now, the Apostle Paul in the Christian faith says that um, in the end, these three abide, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these, Paul says, is love. But I think that love, yes, of course, is the way. But how do you get someone to have the energy and the, the lack of fear to engage in love? I believe it's that you give them hope. Or you reflect to them that you are the hope. You are my hope. Because justice, well, justice is fleeting, isn't it? One day we make, you know, lynching illegal, and then you know, we shoot people in the street, you know, we get selling cigarettes by the cigarette. Justice can come and go, but hope they cannot take away. That's what King was talking about that last night. It does not matter to me now. If they had only known, why do you think, by the way, Obama wasn't assassinated? I was worried about that every day of his presidency. But I know why he wasn't assassinated. If they did that, the king had been assassinated. If God, after they assassinated Obama, this place would really change. Assassination is not the way. We've got to figure another way. We'll gerrymander this, we'll take away some votes, but whatever it is, but we're not going to be assassinated, folks, as we tried that, a whole bunch of that. 
in the 60s, and they still kept coming. You remember that commercial? They keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming, coming, coming. That is the final message of celebration of Dr. King. Don't stop. Don't be afraid. And if you are, do like John Wayne in the movies when the prophet says, Sarge, you're not afraid. John Wayne says, yeah, I'm afraid. I'm just going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the last formal thing I want to say is that we always need to remember that there's more to choose. Even when the greatest success comes, there may be more. As a Latin scholar in high school and college, I had a read Odysseus, Ulysses. And Odysseus, of course, was uh, the leader of the final assault on Troy. Odysseus, after Troy was burning, was standing on the shore. He didn't know it, but it was going to take him 20 more years to get home. But in his God-inspired wisdom, he looked back and he says these words, Memon, for some et I olim, Memonissa you wild, perhaps at some future time it may help to remember these He knew that he had to be looking forward. He was filled with hope. How else could he have told the giant when the giant said, he had poked his eye out and the giant said, who did this? He said, no man did it. No man, I'm looking for you. No man. Because he had hope. King, when we celebrate him, gives us hope. But remember that each of us has had mentors in our lives. You may hear about some of those who inspired me, but every one of us has mentors. My wife and I gave ourselves for Christmas uh, Ancestry.com. <laughs> what to see, you know, when some of the numbers show. And it occurred to me as I was preparing this presentation that Ancestry.com could be a way for us to experience the World House for Justice. As you look at all those percentages, ask yourself the question, what was the journey of that percentage? What kind of crap did they have to go through either to get to this country or to become free in the old country? And what were their justice heroes? And then, if that's their history, when I see my Irish friend the next time, I'll say, don't you remember so and so and so? <laughs> huh? Don't you remember the, the potato famine, what that was really all about? They used to take off the roofs of the houses and you got to face the death? My brother, my sister? No, seriously, Ancestry.com has given us a way of seeing our connection to the world house. It's right there, we just don't recognize it. But recognize all of it. Raise your hand. Yes, I have power to in Southern Iroquois, Southern Algonquin. Here in Northern Ireland. My wife has Seneca. Okay. But I got Irish too. And I found out through a different branch of ancestry that my grandkids have told me, Grandpa, Grandpa, we're from Nigeria too. Well, isn't it? Wouldn't it? Wow, look at that. There it is right in front of me. Not just as a name, but something to live into. When they say there's genocide in Ghana, I mean, Nigeria, I want to know about that. When they say this civil war and the Boko Haram is grabbing women, I want to know about that, because my people. I learned this over the years, because in my travels, I was able to go to, to Nigeria this one time. A patient of mine who came to the States, and we tried to help him, and we found, actually, when we visited him in Nigeria, we found out what the problem was. And he took me to a seashore, it was a beautiful seashore. I mean, this palm tree only had leaves at the top and it just eased up and it was a little, sort of a, almost like an island, it was a peninsula, we went and dug out the new. And I saw this white building, it looked like a beach house, and it was so quiet, beautiful. 
He said to me, I'm sorry. I said, what are you talking about? This should have been able to be your home. But my ancestors let you be taken. I am sorry. And then he said, that is the slave house. That's where you would be in that house and then go to the home. It's going to take a while. But we'll get there. Don't let anything discourage you. You are the path that is needed, especially when your hands are together. And perhaps in some future time, you're welcome to remember. to understand what's the first thing we're going to work on. And let's think about the next two or three things, but let's decide that first thing. For the clerk and, and Mandela, it was simply, uh, they must have talked probably for a year with nobody really knowing that they were not. The, the, the thing about waiting is that they were telling King, the things that we've decided, to, that you've decided to do, don't do that. Wait a minute. King wasn't saying, I want everything now. He was saying, I want to go here. A couple steps. But that was the reality, and that will be the reality. One of my uh, parishioners once said to me, um, when we were talking about the rich young ruler, does that mean I have to give up everything that I own right now? <laughs> no. But what do you think it means? Whatever you think it means, that's what it's going to be. Especially if you talk to your comrades about it. If you work it out with your community of attention. And if it's going to ruffle some feathers, decide if those are the feathers that need to be ruffled now. Not because you feel like ruffling them. It's because, well, I really don't want to ruffle the feathers, but you know, I do want to do this action. One of the things that uh, King and Gandhi agree on nonviolence, it's not just. <coughs> That you don't, that you do not nonviolent direct action when you do say an outward public action, but nonviolence begins in the home, begins with your families, 
fighting domestic violence, fighting neighbor, neighbor ang ang anger, fighting intergroup violence. When I was involved in Rochester in, in the justice movement there to get police um, body-worn cameras and now they're moving to the advisory board, my work was not being out front making the speeches. It was doing pastoral care for the leaders who were fighting with one another who's going to get the credit. Whose organization is going to get the credit? Nonviolence is how we engage one another, ourselves even, and how we engage the groups we're in. If we, if we get used to doing that, then when it comes to a public action, it's going to begin us. One of the painful moments that I've had watching the whole thing in Charlottesville is the difference between the pastors who were singing in front of the Nazis and the kids who thought, well, we got to throw something back, don't we? <laughs> the power is in nonviolence and in uh, the soul forces, you would say, truth force. Before everyone leaves, Alejandra has asked me to just say thank you, and so I want to make sure um, I do that, but should me. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. I wrote, I wrote some things, but trust me, it won't take two minutes. Um, I'm Chevy Devaney, William Smith, class of 95. I'm a associate director of annual giving here at the colleges. And this day is one that I try very, very hard not to miss. Um, I actually have someplace else to be tonight. And when I got the email from Alejandra, I was like, oh, I think I was in Jamaica when I said I'll be there. Right, that was, that was just a few days ago. Um, so I came to the US late 80s. Um, it was the first time I heard the word racism. I had no idea what people in this country or even across the world or around the world had done um, to make it possible for me to even be standing here today. And so when I was a senior here, I received the Martin Luther King Leadership Award and I peripherally understood what that meant, right? I didn't even know I was doing work to be recognized. And I say all that to say that being here tonight has been incredibly important for me and I think a lot of you. The idea of the beloved community is one that I see and I live every day in Geneva, my Penyan family. I'll call you guys my Penyan family. Um, I worked in Penyan for nine years doing this work. In my previous life, I was director of multicultural affairs and worked with Alejandra. And so I just want to thank you for um, visiting us tonight. You said you came from two hours away, and I'm glad you did. <laughs> the dinner was wonderful. The conversations was wonderful. The idea that we are actually all doing what we need to do to continue and maintain and build on the beloved community, I think, is incredibly important. And I'm very, very happy to be a part of this community and other communities, and glad that you were all able to, to join us here tonight to share in this. And I thank Alejandra for um, continuing this um, tradition. And I thank President McGuire for, um, he is, he's tired. The man has been on the road, he's been doing work for us immensely. Not I, tired now. Not tired now. <laughs> <laughs> <They don't work laughs> right. um, but, you know, we're all here for the right reasons and the right purpose. And so I thank you for, for being here tonight. I thank all of you for coming out. And I just hope that we uh, keep up a good fight yes. and that we don't. We're waiting, but waiting means different things to different people, right? And so I hope that we all kind of um, go back and read the letter from Birmingham Jail. It's incredibly powerful, right? And do what it is that we need to do. I got some homework on the back of this, right? So I'm going to go look up uh, Gandhi's Seven Social Evils. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go reread Matthew um, 7 through 12, first off. So thank you again. And I really appreciate it. <laughs>